G'day everyone and welcome back to Chalk Talks. Today we're discussing Postbox Forges. Now many of you have probably seen that I use a weirdly shaped forge compared to what you normally see on the market, although they are becoming more, you know, common. And a lot of the time I get asked why that specific type of forge. And so I decided that I would do a Chalk Talk topic talking about what Postbox Forges are and why they're useful. When it comes to gas forges, there are a million different designs, but there are two very common ones that you see, especially here on YouTube and other places like TikTok and stuff like that. And that is the so-called nine kilo gas bottle forge or the uh, straight through forge and the post box forge. And there are some significant differences to how they operate, despite the fact that they're basically built of the same materials. You're still building them out of a cylindrical canister um, you're still using a burner of some kind, normally a Venturi burner, but sometimes a force air. And so why do we need the different types of forges? And when I say need different types of forges, I don't say that one is better than the other. Both serve their purpose, and we'll get into that in a second. So before we get to postbox forges, I thought that we would discuss the standard forge. And one of the reasons that the postbox forge might be important. Now, in a standard forge, you have a forge floor, which is sometimes an extra fryer brick at the bottom or something like that in order for things to sit on. And then you have a semicircular sort of cavern. Now, the burner can be mounted vertically and normally it's mounted at a rake. And the reason it's mounted at a rake is because when the flame comes in, it then circulates right? Something like that. It actually creates a vortex inside the forge, creating a lot of centralized heat. Now, that's great, but there tends to be one distinct disadvantage in this style of forge, in that the flame is making direct, sometimes direct contact with whatever you're working on. Say this is a hammer billet, that flame is making direct contact with the work. Now, this little middle cone is the blue cone, which is your oxidizing flame. And that oxidizing flame is in putting in a lot of oxygen into the forge in order to combust the gas that is being put in, whether that be propane or LPG or whatever it is. Now, this tends to create a hot spot. Not only that, but it also creates an, a higher oxygenation at that focal point. If we view the forge from vertical, like we're looking down through the top of the forge, then we have a big rectangle, which is our forge floor. If the burner is, say, coming in from here, down at an angle, the hot spot will be in here somewhere, right? So this will be cooler, and this will be cooler, and this will be where the heat is focalized. Now, that will also be normally where the highest amount of oxygen is located and then you've got reoxidizing at the doors and those doors are obviously letting in oxygen from outside which is why they're a reoxidizing area but that means that the highest buildup of scale is going to be occurring in this spot as much as it is the highest amount of heat what we do with a post box forge and i don't actually need to change this very much because the forge is basically a cylinder on its side is that our opening is here at the top Normally we have a forge floor only there to catch your various detritus like flux and slag and all that kind of thing. And our burner is down here. Now the burner is then shooting its cone of flame as it usually does, creating that oxidizing area, but none of it is touching your work, which is right up here. And so therefore, all of the heat that is being given to this is radiant heat. It is not direct heat. It's not being touched by the flame itself, which means that provided this door is small enough and you've also got your two inches of refractory on either side, obviously, and your, your forge roof, whether that be a domed roof or otherwise, you're containing that combustion. And so therefore, all of the oxidization is happening here. Postbox forges run incredibly neutral because there is very little oxygen coming in. When you've got larger doors, there's more oxygen. The only oxygen that is coming in through here is through our Venturi, 
right, or our forced air burner. And what is happening is, is that the pressure of the gas is pushing in uh, LPG, but it's also sucking in oxygen, or in case of a forced air, you've got a blower that's blowing oxygen in to oxygenate the LPG so that it combusts here. But that combustion is all happening down in this area. So once the heat is rising into here, and as we know, heat rises, it is all neutral atmosphere, especially if we've got that nice dragon's breath coming out of the forge door, because that dragon's breath is unexploded LPG or uncombusted LPG combusting in the atmosphere outside of the forge. And that means that there's not enough oxygen inside the forge to combust that LPG or that propane, whatever you're using. The reason that we want that is because that means that inside here, there is no oxygen because that LPG is having to escape the forge in order to combust. Now this doesn't happen until the forge is fully up to heat because while it's getting up to heat, it's still drawing in more oxygen than it's combusting. But once that body is fully combusting inside, there is no room for more, <laughs> for more oxygen, especially because all of the positive pressure is coming out of these much smaller doors. On a standard forge floored for, forge, like a uh, nine kilo bottle forge, you normally have quite a large door. And you can shut this off for when you're actually putting something in there to heat up. But when you open that up, all of that oxygen is rushing back in. And so many forges run with just the door open. This means that you've got much more oxygen access for the flame. And so therefore it's a little bit less efficient at burning LPG. It's a little bit less efficient at keeping heat for the same pressure. So the same volume with a larger door you're going to use more LPG to keep it at the same temperature than you would with smaller doors like this. So with the indirect heat, we also have a lack of hot spotting. This will soak in the radiant heat, whatever material you put in there, whether it be a knife or hammer or whatever, will soak in the radiant heat and therefore become a homogeneous heat much easier than when it has a direct flame on it, much like a blowtorch where you have one spot that's a lot hotter than the rest. Now, it has the added advantage of not sitting on a floor. And because it's not sitting on a floor, it doesn't have anything directly in contact with the work that is actually sucking heat out of that work. And anyone who's worked with a floored, uh, floored forge knows that if you move the piece off the floor a little bit and to the side, you'll see a cold spot underneath, unless you've been heating for a long time. And that is because the floor is itself full of thermal mass and needs to draw heat from the work itself or the work is protecting the floor from taking in heat from the burner. And so therefore, this means that because it's hanging openly in air and being surrounded by radiant heat, it is picking up heat from every angle and having nothing in contact with it to suck heat out, which is amazing for when you're doing stuff like forge welding and stuff like that, where you don't wanna have one side being cooler than the other. It's also really useful for heat training in forges as well. And it has the added advantage of any slag or scale that drops off immediately falls from this onto the floor several inches below the work. So you're no longer having a puddle of scale, which uh, you would have seen in my relining my forge video, which I'll link up here. You will no longer have that puddle of slag or scale that the work sits in. <laughs> and anyone who's forge welded in a floored forge knows that there's always a puddle of scale or slag or flux that you've been using for your forge welding that gets stuck to your work and you have to brush it off or it, you know it eventually melts your forge floor and you can't put your work in there without it sitting in an awkward angle. This doesn't have that disadvantage. It just has an open air area and all of that slag and flux and all that kind of stuff is trapped at the bottom. Added to this is because of the flame being located at the bottom of the forge and because there being no forge floor it doesn't have to worry about the item that you're putting in actually being contacted by the flame, you can do something that I've mentioned on the Forgecast before, which is to put a small amount of charcoal in the bottom of your forge. Just chuck it in through the door or through the roof before you light your forge. And this provides an extra carbon content uh, in the atmosphere that is taking up oxygen because in order for charcoal to burn, the charcoal needs oxygen. So what it does is robs oxygen from the flame that is coming in and therefore robbing oxygen from the atmosphere overall, which increases the neutrality of the forge, uh, the actual forge body itself. And you can continue to throw little bits of charcoal here and there and all they'll do is burn into dust 
and then be expelled by the forge eventually because it's just turning into ash. And this means that you're always going to have a super neutral or reducing atmosphere inside your forge, which is something that's incredibly useful for a lot of things. Now let's quickly talk uh, downsides to the Postbox Forge. As I mentioned, obviously there is no forge floor. So in order for anything small to sit in this forge, it needs to be attached to something, right? You can't just have a knife blade, for instance, let's draw a really crappy knife blade, just hanging out in the middle of the forge because it will just drop, right? So you can't just sit small items in there or hammer billets or anything like that that you wanna work on. You can't sit them in the forge with a short tang or anything like that. So you either have the option of having a pair of tongs to hold the work, right? Or you weld a handle to it. Now, most of the work you see me work in my post box forge has a handle welded to it. But even with the small items like my bottle openers, I still work them in the post box forge. I just have them clamped in a pair of tongs. And this is why I like 14 inch reins on my tongs is because the tongs get pretty hot after a while of sitting in that forge door for a long time. So you can mitigate that kind of thing. And I have made hammers using a hammer billet welded onto a piece of rebar as a handle. But now of course, that means that you have to balance it because if you have you know, a small piece in here, the, pe the rebar can't just be sitting just outside the door because it'll overbalance and fall into the floor. And when it falls into the floor, it's a lot harder to get it out. And that's why having a removable lid is incredibly important because you can then pull the lid off once it's cooled down and fish the thing out the bottom. Unless it's like that bottle opener that was in my relining video, which it had actually sunk into the flux at the bottom and actually it was lost forever until I could uh, take that slag ball out. So you need a longer handle. And so when you have a longer handle, you need something to sit it on. And this is why you see in my post box forge, which you will have seen in that video, it has a rail that sits out from the forge door and that actually supports the handle because I want the, the point of balance to be out past that rail in order to keep this balanced in here. It's also limited on width because you're only getting the diameter of the cylinder minus four inches, two inches each side for the, work, for the, uh, for the ISO wall or whatever refractor you're using. And so therefore, Normally you're limited to about a four and a half to five inch section. I think mine can heat up about five inches and mine's quite, you know, quite large. You can get larger and obviously the wider your cylinder, the better, but the wider your cylinder, the more your LPG you need to heat it. You won't have big, long, <laughs> you know, like heat sections for heat treating or anything like that. But as anyone knows who's in blacksmithing, you don't need to heat a long section unless you're heat treating. Most of the time you only need to heat long sections when you're heat treating or when you're bending something into a circle like in an industry. In other cases where what we're working on, you can normally only hammer a four to five inch section at a time before you need to go reheat anyway because you've run out of heat. It's all sapped off into the atmosphere or into the anvil or into the hammer face or into the press, or whatever you're using. So therefore this gives you a workable section by section of your work and it's not heating more than it needs to. It's only heating the section you're going to work. I find this an incredible advantage, but some people don't like it. Some people you know, like to be able to heat longer sections and obviously having this tipped on its side and having a forge floor means that you can heat longer sections. That being said, you can work any length of material in this because I have a door here and a door here. So I can feed that bar all the way through. I can heat the center section of a bar. I can heat, the, you know, like I can heat at either end of the bar. I can heat any kind of length. And I do all of my swords in my post box forge because it gives me the ability to just push whatever length I want through. The main key disadvantage that I have run into occasionally is the size of the doors. Now, if we were to say that this was actually the front of the forge uh, instead of the side, we'll leave the burner where it is, <laughs> but the smaller the door, the more efficient it is, as I've said before. Some people will build their doors tall and narrow, like I do. Other people, like Kyle Royer, will have it short and wide. 
it doesn't really matter, but normally you're limited to about a two and a half to three inch by three inch or four inch uh, hole. So it's a very narrow hole. It's a very narrow opening. And so therefore working any wide material like ax blades or uh, big buoys, I can fit, you know, obviously I can fit a muso buoy in three inch wide area, but um, anything larger than that, I'm done. I can't work a cleaver in it or anything like that. I have to use a wider forge door and that's where those flawed forges come in is those really wide areas. But when you're working axes and stuff like that, having a floor is helpful because you can just drop the axe head in there anyway. So it's kind of either here or there. And that's why having both of them is better than having just one. And you'll see that I have a forge flawed forge because I make a lot of hammers. <laughs> and it's a lot easier to just be able to drop those hammer billets in there. But when I'm making blades and other you know things that are long and relatively narrow, this is unbeatable. But if you're working a lot of stuff that you want to drop on the floor of your forge, or if you're working stuff that's going to be really wide, like axe heads and stuff like that, this is not the game. You also have to be very, very careful when you're forging out your Damascus that you don't let it widen up past the width of the door. And I've done this. <laughs> so I had to take a Damascus billet that I was forging on the press and I actually had to put it in my flawed forge in order to then narrow it up so I could put it back in the post box because I let it get too wide or too tall for the, uh, for the forge door. And you may run out of room if you want to make a really big billet. Like the biggest billet I can make in my forge is a six uh, pound billet. That's the very largest that I can fit through those doors. So if I want to make any more than six pounds, I need to then go to a larger forge, larger post box, or a flawed forge like I have before. But those are the main key disadvantages. You've seen me reline the forge. It's incredibly easy, incredibly quick. It's much like relining any other forge. And it has the distinct advantage of not having to have a very solid floor. The floor of mine is literally crushed up old uh, fire bricks. It's not a solid flat floor because it doesn't need to be. Nothing sits on it. It would be remiss of me not to mention the man credited with making the first Postbox Forge, or at least perfecting and then letting out the design to the wider community. You will know his name if you're a fan of my channel. You also know his name if you're a fan of the knife making industry, Don Fogg. He developed the original plans and his was the reason why the big Don Fogg kiln that I made is made the way it is. It's made exactly the same way as a postbox forge, small door and a non-direct flame to heat a large area as opposed to a small one like a postbox forge. The Postbox Forge and the Don Fog Kiln are exactly the same thing, just on different scales. So without the man Don Fog, we would not have the Postbox Forge, and he swore by his. And honestly, after using mine and after getting Alex from Valhalla Ironworks to use his, I think we agree that it's pretty amazing. And this comes to the final question. Should you make one? Absolutely. Why not? The thing is, is that as a blacksmith, you will learn that having one forge will not do everything. One forge will not never do everything you want it to do. The closest you could get to that is a relatively good large charcoal forge or a coal forge. But even then, it won't do everything you want it to do well. And much like a Japanese chef in the kitchen, he will have multiple knives, each one of them with a very specific purpose. And as a blacksmith, I have multiple forges for multiple purposes. I have about six to eight forges at any one time, some of them solid fuel and most of them gas. And one of them will be a traveling forge, which is really small so that I can take places. One of them will be a large, heavy ward forge for making my hammers. One will be a post box forge. Maybe I'll have two post box forges, one small and one large. It doesn't really matter because it all comes down to what I need them for. I do not like using too much forge. I don't like using a really big forge for small work. If I'm doing small work on a day-to-day -day basis for a while, which I do occasionally, using a large forge is just a waste of gas, it's a waste of materials, and it takes a long time to heat up. Whereas if I have a really small forge, it takes almost no gas, takes no time to heat up, and it cools down really quickly. So I can just can I get, get done and gone. So, Working your forges to the work that you're making makes a lot of sense. My post box forge, for instance, is built as the mid medium size between too small and too large. It's right in the middle. It's big enough that I can do big work like big swords and Damascus, stuff like that. 
but it's also not so large that I have to worry about how much gas I'm expending if I want to make bottle openers for a day. Realistically, I should have two post box forges, one very small one for making stuff like the bottle openers and leaf keychains and stuff like that, and my large one for making swords and all that kind of thing, but I'm lazy, and so I only built one. <laughs> but that being said, I also have my other big forge for making hammers, which I only ever run when I'm making hammers or larger stock. So it comes down to, do you want to make one? If you want to, make it. If you don't want to, don't. If you're working Damascus or forge welding a lot in gas forges, if you're working with a lot of swords and blades and all that kind of thing, Postbox Forge is like unbeatable when it comes to those kinds of things. If you're making stuff like hammers, axes, things that you want to drop in the forge and not have to worry about fishing out of the bottom accidentally, then don't build one. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it doesn't cost a lot of materials to make and it makes my life a million times easier. So absolutely, make one. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Check out my Patreon in the description down below. And if you liked the video, make sure you hit that bell notification icon to be notified when I upload new videos. Catch you next time.